Okay, well, welcome everyone to this meeting of the virtual CICS user group. Uh, I'm Trevor Reddles. I'm CEO of iTechEd Limited. We're a mainframe consultancy analysis and technical authoring organization. And we're the people responsible for the content on the Virtual Kicks website. And we also produce a newsletter. Uh, just a reminder, the website can be found at uh, virtualcics.hostbridge.com. Com. And we also look after the um, virtual IMS user group as well. Anyway, uh, let's start by running through the agenda for this meeting. As usual, most of the meeting will be taken up with a presentation. And today our guest presenter is Ezreal Gross. He's Principal Solutions Advisor at Rocket Software. And his presentation is called Visualizing Kicks Performance Data in Splunk using Kix Performance Analyzer. And a copy of the slides from this presentation will be on the website later today. Um, if you've missed our previous meetings, you can download copies of those presentations from our website too. And you can also listen again to the whole presentation. There's a link on our resources page. So that's virtualkicks.hostbridge.com forward slash resources.htm. Following Israel's presentation and any questions you have for him, we'll move on to the latest Kix news and the latest Kix related articles. Feedback request is there to remind me to ask you for your feedback about this virtual meeting. And then I'll give you the dates and times for the next couple of virtual meetings. So uh, that's the plan for this meeting. And I'm anticipating that it'll last for about an hour. Okay, um, I need to stop sharing. Um, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to pass over control to Ezreal. Now, Ezreal is a principal solutions advisor at Rocket Software. He specializes in uh, IBM Kix tools. He was formerly the CEO of Circle Software, which uh, Rocket acquired in 2019 where he specialized in hands-on classes and consulting in Kix, DB2 and MQ series. Israel was a gold consultant for many years and is currently an IBM champion. His specialties include web services, web support, performance tuning, internals, Kix presser, SM, DevOps and Liberty as they relate to Kix. He recently co-architected the CProf product, a tool that captures Kix trace without running in a Kix region. So, Ezreal, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. And hopefully you've now got control of the meeting. Thank you, Trevor. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So, let me just blow this up to full screen, I hope. There we go. Uh, and again, thank you, Trevor. Um, uh, I, I'd like to point out to everybody here, um, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where time zone you happen to be in. If you're in the US, please remember to vote. Um, uh, shout out, by the way, to you, Trevor, as I wanted to mention was uh, you've been doing these virtual user group meetings for a number of years. I think you said since 2007, right? And That's notice right. this year, everybody's been going to virtual meetings because there is no choice. So uh, you were certainly a pioneer in the field. So uh, <laughs> uh, a big kudos to you. So uh, let me just start out and give you an idea of what I want to do today, right? Um, and I will point out that you don't actually need Kix PA to uh, do what I'm going to do in this presentation. Um, because it works with um, a support pack that came out with Kix PA, but we provide some sample data, right? So theoretically, even if you don't know anything about Splunk, I'm going to show you how to get a copy of Splunk, Splunk to run on your local machine, although don't get too excited. It isn't going to run that fast. Depends, yeah. I suppose, on the speed of your machine as well. Um, and some sample data. So you can see the exact same visualizations I'm going to show in this presentation. However, I'm also going to point out how to uh, uh, collect data from um, Kix PA, for example, and stream it into Splunk. So just to show you what we're going to do, we're going to do a demo, of course, of the uh, Splunk app 
showing the visualizations. Now, again, these is a sample, right? So it's the support pack. We built these dashboards based on input that I suppose I provided as to what I thought customers would want to see. Um, certainly, we can always upgrade these uh, dashboards to include or exclude certain things that people don't want if we get enough feedback. Um, so I'm going to go through this whole demo of what it is, and then I'm going to go back into my tuning mode. So I'm going to do a little overview of Kix transactions and tuning, a background on, on Kix PA as well, and then why do this and what's new. I'm going to show you the RFEs that came out, which led to this uh, particular support pack, along with the support in the product to do basically two things, right? One is to provide the data in JSON format. Right, so when you actually take a look at what's available to do visualizations today, right? So we'll talk about Splunk. I have an example with some Kibana charts, right? There's Grafana. There's all these uh, um, virtual uh, visual rendering tools that allow you to take data and build yourself some nice charts relatively quickly. Uh, we picked Splunk simply because that's where we got the most number of requests, right? To get data into Splunk. So. KixPA can now produce the data in JSON format. So that's one big thing. The next big thing that we added to KixPA is this streaming concept. The term streaming is kind of a little misleading. We're not dynamically streaming it. We're really just pushing it to Splunk. So I'm going to show you how that works. Then I'm going to go step by step to show you how to install this support pack. And this is again, whether or not you have KixPA or not. So it's irrelevant whether you have KixPA, you can actually try everything I'm going to do in that demo. And then if you happen to have KixPA, I'm gonna show you how to get real live data from your system instead of playing with this ad hoc data that we put together for you. And then just some miscellaneous stuff like how the JSON lines work, what they look like, and then a little bit about some other platforms like um, Elastic. So in terms of the demo, right? So I'm going to just show you the sample app just gives you an idea of what visualizations we thought about. Again, it's not intended to be a fully fledged product out of the box. That's why it's a support pack, right? But it does give you a feel for what we thought was useful, right? Now, again, if you have a good Splunk app developer in your environment, or you have a number of Splunk app developers in your environment generally, then theoretically they can build you any visualizations that you want. It's relatively simple, right? You just identify the types of graphs you want based on the data you're collecting, and you can do anything you want to. So this is just a sample. So let's just now run through the app. So here we go. Now, I just have to find, there it is. Now, I'm going to just go to the main page just to give you an idea. I've obviously installed the Performance Analyzer app. I have loaded some data using this. And I'm going to show you how to do that later. When you actually click on this, it's going to run a little bit slowly because, again, this is on my machine. And while I'm running Zoom, it takes a while to load stuff. You can see a total of five dashboards here. Transaction overview, system overview, weight analysis, kick storage, system alerts, right? Now, system alerts, I will warn you, is something specific to Kix PA. You have to be able to produce these system alerts. So I'm going to talk about how that's done in just a little bit. Now, you'll see it takes about 10 to 15 seconds to draw up the first page. But don't let that bother you because like I said, if you're not running Zoom and other things, it'll run generally within five seconds on your own personal laptop. If you have a server that runs Splunk, it'll run a lot faster. Now, what I'll show you here is notice, he'll tell you right away based on Kix monitoring facility performance class and summarized by Kix performance analyzer. So this, entire dashboard, right? A dashboard is just a collection of graphs, right? This entire dashboard is made up of performance data. Now we've given you certain things that you can search on. There's a time range, there's uh, which I have set to all time. 
which you're going to need to do. There's Apple IDs. So if I click in there, I can see all the Apple IDs that I can actually narrow down the data on. I can look in Kix transactions. Here's all the transactions we collected in the sample data. You can change the top 10 results and get top 100. And then there's even an extra search filter, which if you read the instructions, it'll give you some of the filters you can do, like I'm not interested in Kix transactions. Then what happens is, is you get all the charts. So we start with a main chart at the top. So you could see this kicks transactions per second, right? This is across all my regions. And you'll see the wonderful thing about Splunk is if I put my cursor on it, it'll tell me how many I had at the interval that I'm actually looking at here, right? Now, I will do this once because it'll redraw the whole thing. One thing nice about Splunk is you can carve out an interval that you're interested in, and then all the other graphs will be reset based on the interval of time that you're specifically looking at. So if you actually want to do some tuning or you recognize that there's a problem occurring, then obviously you might want to look at a specific interval. So where are you going to start? Usually you're going to start at kicks transactions per second, which you can see right there. So that's why I, I kind of I um, selected that little portion of the graph out. Let me just reset that now so I can show you the other graphs that we actually gave you over here. So we start with some kicks transaction metrics, right? And as these things fill in, you'll see that this is over this all time period. Generally, you're not going to do it over the entire period of time, but you can see we ran 11,639,155 transactions. The average user CPU time was this, the average response time was that. So there's some generic metrics. Again, this is all part of the transaction overview. Now we have a breakdown. So you could see average response time by Apple ID. Yeah. And again, if you move your cursor, it will tell you which Apple ID we're looking at. It will also highlight if you just look down at the bottom of this chart, FUW, FWTR is highlighted there. If I move to that graph, it's FUW, FW, FR. So it's very interactive, right? So you get the average response time by Apple ID. Here's average user CPU time by Apple ID. So we had a peak there in a region called FUW, FW, IR, right, where we saw that the average user CPU time by Apple ID shot up for a little bit of time between this interval. Now, yes, I could select this interval. It will redraw any of the graphs underneath that are related to this particular item. But instead of doing that, let's just take a look at some of the other graphs. So there's the average response time, which you can easily see there by transaction. And so you could see that says CSOL, the transaction. I know it's very hard to read it. But if I go down here, this is CSSY, the different color is easier to read. And so you can get the average response time by transaction, average user CPU time by transaction. So CSOL is the big green line here because most of our transactions came in via the web. Now, again, if this were a standalone chart and it was a little bit bigger, or uh, if you can see the, the left-hand side of the graph goes all the way up to 20 seconds, which is part of the problem. So you might want to adjust it if you wanted to actually see it. The other thing you can do is move over the transactions at the bottom of the screen, and it'll just highlight for you that line. And they're all showing up as one line because most of the uh, average CPU per transaction was relatively small. So it's picking out the bad ones for you. This is a cool chart. I've used this in the past. And so let me just say, graph, this is not my first introduction to graphing data. Uh, we were able to get the data in CSV format in the past. And what I used to do is import that CSV data into an Excel spreadsheet and build the charts that I wanted to. And so I tend to like this uh, average response times, right? So I get the response time, user CPU, and the dispatch time. The problem is, is as you can see in this graph, it's showing up really, really small. So the sample data isn't the greatest, but at least it's a sample that you can work with, right? So there's the average response time, there's the average dispatch time, and somewhere in there is also the, the average user CPU time, but it's hard to see. Now, normally, what you'd expect to see is the top of the chart is always going to be the response time. That's the longest or the highest expense, followed by whatever the user CPU and the dispatch time, right? Because dispatch is next, followed by the amount of physical CPU that you used. So this is another good one, weight analysis. And again, this is weight analysis showing you the different types of weights here. And there's unfortunately like four pages of different weights that are available to you here. So you'd have to find the chart that it's on to be able to see it, 
right? And there it is. This is TCA weight, right? And so you can see that uh, there was a lot of weights associated with uh, terminal weights. Then you get by Apple ID average response time, you get by transaction top 10. So CSOL was my number one uh, transaction. Total user CPU time by region. Uh, this is total user CPU time by transaction, right? Task counts, right? Average suspend times, average response time, average user CPU time. And again, the average user CPU time here, you can drill down if you wanted to, to get uh, more detail, uh, average dispatch time. So these three charts together made up this one chart I have over here. So maybe it's easier for you to look at it over there. And then you get some other things like average suspend time. The key is, is you might not want to use all of these charts, but this is an idea of what you can do with the data. And I'm going to show you how to collect the data in a little bit of time. We added things like average file and journal control time. So you could see that and average first dispatch wait. So there's some uh, dispatch wait time associated with it. This is all within one dashboard, right? So do you need this dashboard? You can use it as is, or you could subtract or extract out the charts that you want and build your own custom chart. Let's take a look at a few more of these before we continue, right? So this one is system overview. And again, these are samples. You get them straight out of the box. You just need to download it. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute. Same sort of filters at the top, but you can see this is transaction manager percentage of max task over time by Apple ID. So you could see something like that. And then you could see transaction manager number of transactions by Apple ID, transaction manager percentage of max task by Apple ID, right? So there's 60. 3.3% of max task, and you could see side by side, you weren't anywhere near max task, right? So it's nice to see them side by side. So these are some sample charts. We didn't have any TRAN classes set at the time, so you won't see any data there. Some information on MROISC connections, so you could see some failed um, connections over there. These are the dumps that were taken, temp storage queues, right? Dispatcher CPU time, a lot of people always ask me this question, right? If they wanna find out how well they're doing. So you could see the address space SRB time and there's the uh, address space CPU time. And um, there's some information on DB2 connections, um, DB2 entries, log streams, MVS log streams, dispatcher TCB modes. This is the one I'm looking for, right? So this is dispatcher TCB modes, average CPU per dispatch ratio, QR versus L8. And so you could see right here, there's the QR CPU dispatch ratio. And we like to see that at 80% or higher. I'm gonna to refer to that later in the notes. And then you can see some L8 CPU uh, dispatch ratio. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of information in here. And I'll point out, this is based on Kik statistics. This is a weight analysis report, right? And what I'm gonna show you in here is this is just like the Kix performance analyzer weight analysis report, right? So you can see an overall summary at the top, which you saw on the earlier pages, and then a breakdown by transaction. And you can hover over it and see where the actual weights are occurring. Here's CWBA. And this one is dispatch delay, right? There's another one with dispatch delay. Yeah, and so you can, and if I clicked on this, which I don't want to do because I don't want to redraw again, it will actually give you detailed analysis at the transaction level. Now, there's some information on kick storage, as you can imagine, within kick storage. What, what do you think you're going to see is peak DSA usage by Apple ID, right? So these are all nice little samples we put together for you. So there's a little bit on DSA. Let's get to system alerts. Now, let me warn you about system alerts, right? If you're using system alerts, you have to be using Kicks PA that drives these alerts. Effectively, these use statistics where you set certain threshold values. And should you exceed those threshold values, you could either see a warning, an informational or critical alert. And so you could see, obviously I have a bunch of different thresholds being set. And if you use this, you can see file string weights, right? So if I just go to file string weights, you can see over a period of time, the number of string weights that we got, right? You can also see system dumps taken. You can see time suspended for storage. Ah, 
So that's part of a problem during that interval of time. And again, if I just select this interval of time, I don't want to redraw the chart right now, but if I were just to select that, and I'm not going to do, I just did it. Okay, let's reset it, sorry. Uh, if I were to just select that interval of time, all the graphs would just show that interval of time. Now, just to finish off this kind of display here, as soon as it finishes drawing my page here, uh, it's going to show you this alerts by Apple ID as it fills it in. And there you go. We had a bunch of alerts in a particular region that I'd want to expand on. Okay. And down toward the bottom here, it's going to give you the verbiage associated with them. How many critical, how many warning and informational, because this is really informational type uh, data, right? So you actually want to be able to see, although graphically it's a lot easier to look at if you ask me. Now, you could see the critical alerts, warning, informational alerts by Apple ID and severity, and there's some nice charts here, but I want to take you down toward the bottom and show you this. So the one thing missing from this chart, and I have to say that, you know, maybe on the next iteration, I'll have them put it in here. And again, it wasn't that I wasn't thinking we wanted to get this out as quickly as possible. These are the actual alert data, right? If I pull this little thing, you can see the physical alert that came in in JSON format. There it is. Now, what, one of the things you'll see here is normally when you have an issue like NQs weighted in NQ pool local, there's the threshold we set. This is how many we got. This is a severity considered to be critical. There's the region, there's the image, and then it'll give you the NQ pool ID and there's the resource name. Or let's pick another one that's interesting, right? File string weights. If we saw more than 10, we wanted to be notified, right? But we got 24 in this region, and then we get file name and then the name of the file, right? So there should be a way to express this information, probably graphically as well, but we haven't been able to do that, right? Um, because again, we, we, we haven't thought about how to chart that out. So that is kind of the demo that I wanted to show you. Now I'm gonna show you um, how to do this yourself. Any questions so far? I think everybody's probably on mute, so maybe we'll hold the questions to the end. So here we go. So let me just say, right? I, I stuck this into the presentation just to remind you why we're doing tuning, right? In today's world, right, with the ever-expanding costs, the pressure to reduce expenditures, and the fact that, you know, looking at tabular reports is complicated. I've been doing it for years, so I'm pretty darn good at it. But most people, if they don't look at it for a while, they put it down, it's really hard to start and look at some tabular report and amazingly pick out something that you can actually fix to solve the problem, right? So you need some sort of a tool, whether you write it yourself or you purchase a product, you need something that's going to let you analyze this data. The question is, is what data do you want to analyze from a Kix perspective? So at the end of the day, what you're really looking at is in the world of Kix, right? A business transaction is made up of multiple individual tasks, right? And Kix reports information at the task level. So when we talk about performance, unfortunately, we have to look at the performance of individual tasks as they relate to an application within a transaction. But we can get down to things like details at the program level. Now, Within Kix, we all know that uh, tasks run concurrently, especially if you're using multiple TCBs. If you're only using one TCB, the QR, then it's all about task switching, right? So it's how fast Kix can switch between the tasks and give CPU briefly to each one of them. So in terms of being able to collect the data that we're looking at, so the information you see in the sample did come out of Kix monitoring, right, or CMF. Those are our SMF 110 type 1 and 110 type 2 records, right? And that's how we get the performance and statistics data. So before we can even think about the tool to analyze it, we have to make sure that we're physically collecting it. So I'm going to go through a little bit about what you might want to collect, right? But you can collect data about individual Kix transactions, that's performance related, SMF 110 type one records, and they're written to SMF and you can process them offline later on. 
you can collect up to four classes of data, as you can see here. Most people will collect performance and exception data because that will give you one record per transaction in terms of performance. And for exception, it'll give you any exceptions that occur, which you're hoping won't be a heck of a lot of them, right? And then you can see you can collect a lot of data and therefore there's automatic compression in place. You can use an MCT to exclude fields. Most people actually use an MCT to include fields because Kicks compression actually helps a lot in terms of the amount of data that you collect. And then you could process this data with Kicks PA. There are other products, uh, including some free utilities like DFH dollar malls, right? So a little bit about what you want to look at, right? Just in general, we're looking at one of two things when we're looking at an application running in Kix. We're usually looking at the overall response time and underneath that, what the CPU time is of the transaction. So I start at response time because it includes CPU time. And I say it consists of two elements, the time that you're suspended. So the task is not executing, it's waiting for some reason or what we call the dispatch time. So if you noticed on the charts I showed you earlier, we had um, dispatch time, we had suspend time, we had response time. And so dispatch time is further divided into two pieces. Dispatch time is of course the CPU time while you're executing, but it could also be the wait time where the CPU is actually not, uh, you're not running on the CPU simply because Kix is not currently dispatched by the operating system, right? And so if Kix itself as the region is not getting enough CPU, then chances are you running inside that region are not getting enough CPU. So what you like to see, and in a production environment, no question about it, I actually would prefer it higher, the CPU to dispatch ratio, right? It should be 80% or higher, right? And that's the CPU time divided by the dispatch time. Now, again, that was one of the charts that we provided earlier. If you look at the structure of a particular Kix transaction, and yes, we're talking about an individual Kix task at this point in time. What we're actually looking at here is the fact that uh, when you first start, right, you get attached by somebody else, Right, so it's a task attached time. I don't know, it could be terminal control. It could be the CSOL transaction because you're coming in via the web. When you're actually attached into the system, the first thing you have to wait for is this first dispatch delay, right? And that's effectively the wait to get the resource that you want to run on, which is a TCB, right? Now, if the guy who dispatched you, for example, is terminal control, and he runs on the QRTCB, until he goes to sleep, you aren't gonna get a chance to run. So as long as it takes for you to get your first chance to run, that's considered the first dispatch delay. Other things that could delay you in terms of that process are things like tran class and max task, right? Because theoretically the system could be at max task and you're not gonna get a chance to run until somebody else completes. Or you're in a tran class and the class is currently full with other transactions. You have to wait for one of those specific transactions to complete. And so we could see first dispatch delay plus additional delays. Now, eventually you get a chance to run, that's the dispatch time. And you can see right in the center that is the CPU time or the user CPU time, right? But notice during the dispatch time, you could be suspended for other things. The time it takes to load your program or some other involuntary MBS wait time. And so it is possible you could wait for other reasons. Now, in Kix itself, if you're doing any journal I.O. or transient data I.O. or terminal control or file control I.O., you could get suspended for an additional period of time. When you get redispatched, notice you have the redispatch wait, right? You have to wait for the TCB possibly to start up again. So Kix spends a transactions time in waiting and running, waiting and running. The overall is the total response time of the individual task, and there is the piece associated with CPU. Now for completeness, this is the complete breakdown, and you could see the individual IO weights, and so you could see first dispatch time plus any of the IO weights plus any other wait time plus unaccounted wait time, 
makes up the time that you're suspended. And again, if you look at the weight analysis chart, those little circles that I didn't expand on earlier, you can drill down to the individual weights and it's possible that you can improve some of the weights and therefore improve the overall response time of the transaction. So, now let's talk a little bit about Kicks PA. So we know what we want to tune. It's mostly response time and it's CPU time if you're looking at the transaction level. If you're looking at the system level, it's mostly statistical information about how the Kicks region is running and what you can do to improve that. So Kicks PA is simply a tool that takes that SMF data and generates reports. That's what it's always done. Yeah. And the key behind generating these reports is the fact that nobody wants to look at the SMF data as a whole because it's just way too much data to comprehend. So you need something that extracts just the data you want out of these records and produces a nice tabular report, or at least that's what we always wanted. Now, again, it uses SMF as input data. It's easy to use. And the key behind Kicks PA, for example, is there's over 250 supplied report forms, which means you probably don't have to think too much about what you want to report on. Hopefully, we've come up with it and given you a sample report form that shows you what it looks like. Again, it's for performance and statistical analysis. And you did have graphical performance analysis via the Explorer in the past, and it still works today. But it was complicated. You had to take CSV data, comma delimited data, and download it to your PC that was running the Explorer, or you had to put it off in DB2, right? And because the data was in comma delimited, there was no information about that data. You had to use a report and understand what position each of your data elements was in. Now, Today, you can now see the data in JSON, which removes that restriction on understanding the order in which the data was returned to you. And with the forwarder available, we can forward it to any platform you want. So let's talk about why do this and what's actually new within the product, right? So for those people that are actually running Kicks PA or thinking about playing with Kicks PA, right? These were some of the requests for enhancements that we got, right? They wanted some sort of a web-based solution with browsers and dashboards, and it was very generic. Most people didn't know exactly what they wanted to, but when we narrowed it down, the idea was we needed a different format, right? The tabular format was great for reporting, but it wasn't really good to manipulate the data after it was in a report. Comma delimited helped, but you needed a template to lay over it to understand where the data was and in what order. And then because it was in JSON format, we wanted uh, Splunk because many customers run Splunk. Again, it's not a requirement. You can run other graphics tools as I'm gonna show you a little later on. So the existing functionality in PA was effectively take the SMF data, take a report form, run it through Kicks PA, and it would return the data in either CSV format or in a report format. And the destination was certainly an MVS data set, right? Which you could print or download and wonderful things like that. What we physically changed with the product is, and PA alerts were around for a while longer too, but what we uh, physically changed was the fact that we can take the alert definitions that we had before, and we could feed that into PA so that we can actually just send, so J, uh, CSV was here already, we can just format the data in JSON lines. Now, because the data is formatted in JSON lines doesn't mean you have to forward it or stream it anywhere else. You can actually send it off to a ZOS Unix system services file. Maybe you're running something on the mainframe that's able to render the reports in a graphical format, or you want to do something with it within ZOS itself. So you can actually ship it off there. Or if you want to, of course, you could send it to TCP IP as a destination. And TCP IP would be a host and a port number of where you have your platform, whatever the analytics platform is, which in our case is Splunk, but again, could be anything else. So why use PA? 
there's lots of products out there on the marketplace that say, you know, Israel, why don't we just send the entire SMF record down to whoever and wherever? In fact, there are products out in the marketplace and services out on the marketplace that says, send me your SMF data and we'll render it for you. Well, what I'm hoping to show you is the rendering is so simple, it's silly to send it anywhere else. And if you actually run KixPA first, you can only send the data that you actually want to analyze. There's so much more in an SMF record that if you actually sent all the SMF data to Splunk, Splunk would be quite happy because A, number one, you pay for every byte you send to them, right? And A, number two, the rendering is going to take a heck of a lot longer when the data is huge, right? And so you're much better off doing it the mainframe level and deciding, yes, the record is X big, but I only need uh, 1 20th of that record. And I only need these certain fields to produce the graphs that I physically want. And that's the idea behind this. Now, our sample is simply us deciding what you may want, but you may not want what I've done. And you may decide, you know what, I can actually even reduce the number of bytes that I'm shipping down to Splunk or wherever it might be, because I'm only interested in these three or four reports and I'll build a very simple dashboard that only needs a couple of bytes of data. And I do have some customers that are physically doing that. They got the ideas from the support pack we just showed you and they decided these are the only reports we wanna see. Okay, what fields do we need that service those reports. And therefore, let's build a new report form that only sends those fields of data. And suddenly, they can support loads and loads of data in Splunk with no work, um, you know, with no additional cost associated with it, right? So I'm going to show you a little bit about how we built it anyway. So we'll show you how to define a KixPA report form. You should know a little bit about that if you've done it before. We're going to use some existing KixPA selection criteria to filter which records to forward, and we'll show you a little bit about that next. So, again, KixPA is very form based reporting, and I'll, I'll describe what that really means. Basically, you have a form name, and in the form, you say, This is the field name I want, this is how long that particular field is. And in a report form, you have lines and lines and lines of this data. That's effectively what you actually have within a report form. Uh, and you decide which fields. And the only limitation in the old tabular forms is obviously your screen width, right? But now that we're dealing with JSON data, you have a lot more, right? Because screen width is irrelevant today. So you can actually build a report form that has just the fields that you want. So we can add performance, list and summary reports. Summary is a summarization already of the data. List is a detailed report. So if you're looking at transaction data, it's one record per transaction. Then if you're doing statistics, you also have the list and summary, but you also have the alerts. So let's just talk a little bit about statistic alerts, because again, if you're not a KixPA user, you wouldn't know about this yet, right? It helps you find potential tuning opportunities, helps you identify some trends, it will allow you to focus analysis on a specific Kix region or a type of time of day, or a specific resource within the Kix environment. Now, here's an example. You build a condition right? A condition is just a formula and you have up to three thresholds, right? The formula itself could be based on kick statistics fields or whether or not a field exists entirely. Like if I'm looking at system dumps, if there are any, I want to know about it, right? But here's a sample formula. And these are actually the field names that you would get. So this is current active user transactions as a percentage of the max task, right? So as you can see, you take the total number divided by this times 100, and that will give you the percentage of max task, right? The current number of tasks times uh, divided by the max task times 100. So if max tasks were 100 and you're running 64, you're going to get 64%, right? It's very simple. But now you set some thresholds. If I'm above 50%, I want information. If I'm above 80%, I want a warning. If I'm above 95%, I want a critical alert, right? And basically, this is the data that fed that chart that you saw that I showed you on alerts. Now, 
have to tell you about that. So now let's talk about what's new in Kix PA. So as I mentioned to you earlier, we have this new output format called JSON, right? JSON's not a new format. It's the fact that we're using JSON to output the lines that's new. We also have some new destinations so we can forward it. Some people like to use the term stream it, but it's not streaming to me would be as it happens, right? Uh, you still have to run a Kix PA job to do this. And therefore I don't like the term streaming more like forwarding, but yes, I could forward the data to a TCP IP port or a Unix system services file, right? Now, you can take any existing form in Kix PA, those 250 samples, and just say, give me the data in JSON format. No work for you guys to do. It just exists. Now they did add uh, this uh, new time format, right? So we'll give you some details of that later on, this ISO 8601, so that the data can be easily ingested into some of these tools like Splunk and Elastic, right? And then there's a new sample report set that I'm gonna show you in just a second. So now is the proof that everything I did before you can do yourself and you don't need to buy Splunk and you don't need to buy Kix PA. And I would suggest you have a play with it to see whether or not it has value to you. So here we go. What do you have to do to get this screen that I showed you right over here? What is it that you have to do so that you can click through and wait the five seconds for each friggin' thing to draw. Now, like I said, if you have a server running Splunk or you have a group of people that work with Splunk, it's gonna be a lot easier to do. But what do you have to do so that you can see the same thing that I'm seeing here? So I will show you that it's quite simple. You basically have to install Splunk. We developed the apps that we're gonna show you using Splunk 7.3.0. The one I'm showing you is at 8.0.3. Uh, I noticed there was a little bug at 8.1.0. So they're uh, actually working on a, a little fix for that. So I get the impression that you probably wanna stay within the Splunk version if you can. And again, the problem I had was very, very small anyway. Now you can run Splunk as a native application under Windows, which is what I'm doing, or you can install it in a Docker container if you're a Docker user. Now, once you install Splunk, you basically get the native app. And what that means is when you go to this screen over here, if my cursor comes back, when you go to the main menu here, all you're gonna see is no Kix Performance Analyzer. That is the app itself, right? So I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna go into full screen again for a minute here. I'm gonna show you that you can download the app directly or you can download it from the Splunk based web website. So you have to install the app. That's pretty easy. So download Splunk, install the app we created, which are basically the sample dashboards. Then what you need to do is download the sample data and documentation about our support pack, upload that data into Splunk, and you're ready to go. So let's go through the process so you see how simple it is. So this is a picture of the current Splunk website when I went there. And if you go to splunk.com or in the right hand corner, it says free Splunk. Ooh, exciting. You click that button. Now, if this is the first time you've used Splunk, the way Splunk likes to do it is they like to give you a 60 day trial and then you could convert it to a free one. I converted mine to a free one once my trial expired. Now, if you can afford Splunk, you certainly wanna buy it, but with the non-free version, it makes you sign on every time you go to your data. With the free version, it bypasses the sign-on screen. So you have to actually select the software and download it, and you'll have to register at least the first time. Now, when you choose your download, like I said, if you wanna try and run the same release as us, you do 7.3.0 and you can get to that instead of just clicking the download for the current release, you could click this older releases and it'll give you some options to see what the older releases are. And then you'll get to my screen. Now you'll see this screen does not look like mine. It's missing the box that says, our Kix PA sample app, so how do you get it? Well, you click find more apps right there, and then you'll get a screen that looks like this, and you put in Kix space PA in the search box, and this'll pop up over here, and you click install. It's really that easy. 
Now, you'll have to log in with that user ID and password that you got it for the first install because again, you're on the um, trial version to start out. Once you've logged in, then you can say, ah, we're complete, go home. Go home will take you to the main menu and you will now see that little app in the corner. But remember, at this point, you have no data. Now, a little tip at the bottom, I used to have some additional screen prints. Uh, some people cannot get to uh, Kix PA, that sample app, because of some restriction. You can also get it off of splunkbase.splunk.com, and it's very similar screens to what you just saw. Now, now that you got Splunk and you got our sample app, you have to do a search for CA10, the support pack. Now, within here, he will just show you, you can download the description. This is the APAR you would need to support it within Kix PA. But again, for our example here, we're not going to run it in Kix PA, but I'll show you how to do that anyway. You scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you can get this uh, user documentation, which I did, and the sample data. And I'll show you if I extract out of here. This is where I stuck it, right? So you can see in my artifact, I have the user documentation, and I'll just open that up quickly. It's a PDF file. Uh, you don't need to read through this, to be honest with you. It's like uh, 86 pages, and really the installation piece is what I'm showing you now, which is only the first, I don't know, a couple of pages within there. And there's the sample data. It's in a um, compressed uh, zip file, and you have to extract that from the zip file before you do the install. So I wanted to show you that. Now. Once you've done all that, right, you'll see the IBM Kix Performance Analyzer now shows up on your screen. But you want to get data in there, otherwise the whole thing's useless. So you click Add Data, and then you click this Upload button because you're uploading it from your PC into your Splunk instance. Then you select the file source, and this works like anything else. Find it on your machine wherever you put it in unzipped format. And so I went to where it was stored on my machine. There it is, right? And I select that particular JSON-L file in its unzipped folder. And then I click Next. And you'll see the Next is all at the top, right? So you're actually going through it at the top. And you want to click Next when you get the done message, right? So it says, I've uploaded the data. Now. You have to set the source type so he understands that the app is to use this data with the particular source type. But that's relatively simple. You click source default value, application, and then you click Kix PA. And it'll start showing you what the JSON data looks like. Once you do that, you click next because you've set the source type to Kix PA. And then he, he has this little review screen, right? And this is where you could name it anything you want to. It doesn't matter. This is the host field value. You know, it's not important. Down here, obviously, the index should be set to Kix PA. And then you'll get this little review screen, and you click Submit. And then you're pretty much done. Do not click this Start Searching. It'll send you down a rabbit hole. What you're better off doing is clicking that Splunk Enterprise right up there at the top corner, or again, pulling down the apps and going right into Performance Analyzer. And then you'll get almost the screen that I saw. The problem is, and I'll show it to you over here live, inside the default data, right? So if we go back in here and we open this up, one of the things you'll see is I had to set this at least once. Did I click? Thought I did, sorry. Uh, I had to set this at least once uh, first time through because he sets the time range over here. So I'll click the down arrow. He sets the time range by default to today or something like that, right? Within the presets tab over here, there's an all time. And since we collected the sample data quite a while ago, uh, in order to be able to see our sample data, you want to make sure that this is set to all time. And then you'll see the exact same charting that I did. Obviously, over time, if you end up sending your own data here, then that's going to be a different time. Now, so 
hopefully that shows you how easy it was. This is like a cookbook, right? You could literally go back to this cookbook and by the time you're done, you'll have Splunk downloaded, you'll have our sample app installed, you'll have uploaded the data, you'll have set the time preset. And next thing you know, you can actually see the same charting I did. Tell us which charts you like. So let's talk a little bit about how to forward JSON lines in Kix PA. So if you are a Kix PA user and you install the support pack, I wanna show you what you're gonna see that's different. But for those that don't have Kix PA, if you do look at it in the future, one of the things is, is I'll describe how it's working under the covers. So what will happen now is when you go to our report set, a report set is physically just a set of individual reports that you want to run at the same time. One of the nice things about PA is it can run 5, 10, 20 different reports all at the same time with one pass to your data. So that's one of the advantages of using PA. What we added was this little tab called forwarding, and we added underneath that the tab for performance and statistics. Now, if you were to look at, for example, the performance tab, one of the things you'll notice, and again, if you're a Kix PA user, this will look normal to you, is the fact that underneath the performance forwarding tab, we stuck in three individual forms, one called a trend list, one called a trend sum, the other called a trend weight. Now, if you were to look online, you can find these reports trend list, trend sum, and trend weight. And these are just basically the forms I described to you guys earlier, right? In the fact that a particular report form is just a list of the fields you want in the order that you want them, right? But at the end of the day, this is what we need to support the dashboard. So we made this the default performance forwarding forms if you get my drift, because we knew that these forms supported the data that we need to show you our sample graphs. If you decide down the road that you don't need all that data, or you're only interested in some of it, you can build your own report forms and only send the data you want. Every report form is supported with Kix um, uh, PA and JSON. Now you'll notice for statistics, we needed a lot more, right? To give you all the rest of the dashboards, which are mostly statistical in nature, we had to collect information on transaction dumps, NQs, storage, DSA, TDQs, TSQs. Again, any of these you're not interested in, pull them out of here. They won't be shipped down to the dashboards, which means they won't be displayed. And so you probably would rather send them to a custom set of dashboards only based on the information that you want. Now, some additional thing we added, this is an example of the forwarding panel. And you'll notice instead of just CSV format, we support JSON. We also identify what port you want to send it to. So this is very similar to the performance extract panel. We also added a new connection settings to Kix PA, which will allow you to specify the host and the port that you want to stream or ship this to. Now, the process itself. And the only important thing to understand within this process is the fact that A number one, you need that APAR. And A number two, this is not streaming because if you don't run the job to produce those reports you just saw earlier for performance and statistics, it isn't going to stream a darn thing. But if you want to use your own data, right, this is when I suggest start by making sure you have these things turned on. And every time you report anything within Kix PA, you make sure these are set to yes and make sure you specify where you want the data streamed and within one interval. And effectively what you're going to get is the data will automatically be shipped to Splunk at the time you submit those batch jobs. Now, a little bit about what Kix PA is just a little bit under the covers, right? For those that have used Kix PA for years, you know that Kix PA is really all about building JCL. The ISPF panel interface is really there just to allow you to build JCL that allows you to extract just the right data out of SMF and produce these wonderful reports. Well, what we added and what happens when you ask for JSON and forwarding is we added a new 
PA control operand called connection. And so you could see this host and port. Uh, there's a timeout value that you can set. And then there are some security parameters down at the bottom of the stream screen. But again, you only need to set security uh, uh, information here if uh, Splunk is not running within your intranet, right? Or the mainframe can't get to it easily, or you want to encrypt the data. And so you could see we support um, SSL encryption. So if you want to send the data in encrypted format to another machine that happens to be outside of your intranet that um, you're worried that people might be looking at the data, you can add the full level of security. It's all supported, but it's optional. Then this is also some new parameters for the Kix PA report operands themselves. And you can see in here, there it is, if you want it in JSON, what labels you want to put on the data, ASCII to absolute conversion, time formats, and the like. So, what about the actual JSON lines? So JSON lines from Kix PA is not Splunk centric. So here comes the advertisement. Don't worry, I don't got Splunk. I got Elastic or I got Grafana and I'm not a Splunk user. Am I out of luck? Well, uh, not entirely out of luck. It just kind of means that you know, you might have to build some of your own dashboards, or we might be building some down the road. So JSON lines by themselves were designed to be ingested by any application that understands JSON. For example, you can use an Elastic Stack. Uh, the documentation in the support pack CA10, remember I said it was 86 pages, but the first, I don't know, 15 or 20 pages is all you need to do to install the support pack. The rest of it shows you how to build your own version or change what you have within our sample dashboard or build your own version in some other stack. So just as an example, I asked them to do a little piece of this for me. And down the road, if we get some requests from customers, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, we might do this on a permanent basis. But the idea is this is raw data right, ingested from Kix PA in an Elastic stack. And so you could see this was the PA data shipped to Elastic. Then what we did was manually, we built some rudimentary visualizations in Kibana. So for example, we had the number of tasks by Apple ID over time. So you could see the different tasks and you could see it's by Apple ID. And this was us just building it over here, right? This is out of the transaction summary. And you could see we did a sum of all the tasks and you can physically build the, infra the, the graphs based on the data that was provided to you. Now, this is a little bit more complex. This is just showing you uh, an early prototype of statistics alerts in a Kibana dashboard. Notice Kibana uses these tag clouds, right? So instead of physically clicking on a button, he'll give you letters or words, and the bigger they are, the more of them you have. So you'll notice right away it tells you NQ's weighted in NQ pool local was the biggest problem you had. But you can also see storage time suspended is not that small. Uh, storage times, no storage in the DSA is a little bit smaller than that. There's transaction dump requested tiny, right? And you can click on any of these and get the details. And then you could see we were able to quite easily produce the same bar charts we did earlier in Splunk in Elastic, right? Now, if somebody says, hey, Ezra, I absolutely need this all in Elastic, the same thing you gave us in Splunk, I would suggest you put an RFE out there or you send me some notes so I can forward it on to development and say, yeah, I kind of need this in this Elastic as well. And so here's just an example of a standalone chart, data now filtered by a selected alert, storage time suspended for storage, again, in the last. Now, just to finish this up, right? This is just an example of JSON line output in performance list format. So if you've never seen JSON before, it's name value pairs. It's got a curly bracket to start. There's the name of the field colon its value. So the easiest one to look at is Apple ID colon. That's my Apple ID. Trend is this. It's a performance list report. So I'll get one of these for each transaction. So what fields I get here is all about what we decided to ship, right? And this is out of those sample trend forms that you saw earlier. If you don't want, oh, I don't know, start time, 
just eliminate it from the form. It won't be shipped down. You will not be able to use it to graph stuff, right? I tend to think everything on this list is probably needed, right? So the code is just to map it to a Splunk source type. So the code is really just what it's called. The rest of this is the data that we can use in our various different graphs, right? Here's a sample statistics alert. So you could see it's sysalert. And again, you could see the collection time severity. There's the alert in which region, uh, system type, interval type, end of day statistics, threshold was greater than 25, we got 467. But the resource and the resource value, we don't explore within the charting because you know we haven't thought about how we want to do that yet. But obviously we show you the data anyway at the bottom of the screen. Now, again, a little bit about this ISO 8601 time and date format. There's lots of different time and date formats. Uh, Splunk happens to like this one, so it's better if we could send it in this format. Uh, so far, I think we support five or six different date and time formats. Uh, if we find any that you need that we're missing, we'll probably add them. Now, one last comment about data volumes, right? Performance list data is one per transaction. And if you run a couple of million or a billion transactions a day, you're still going to get a lot of data, right? There's other data types like performance summary and statistics that are much low volume. So you might want to have a think about not shipping everything, but maybe only ship the transactions that run during a peak period of time. That might pay to do, right? So the key behind Kicks PA, like why not just take the entire SMF record? Well, the key behind using something like Kicks PA is summarize it before you ship it to a tool that charges you for every byte you ingest in it. So any more information you want, there's the link to get the support pack itself. Like I said, you don't need Kicks PA. You could download the support pack, its data, and see the same sample charts that I showed you earlier. So now I'll just open it up to questions and turn it back to um, uh, Trevor at the end of that. Any questions? Uh, I guess you can unmute yourself, I'm assuming, if you oh, had oh, any questions. Well, they've got the chat box. If you type them in the chat box, so I'll, I'll read Or type them in the chat box. If I can find out how I can find my chat. Um, it's right at the very end on that more bit, the three dots more, if you find gotcha. that. Gotcha. Yep. Okay, so Jonathan said to get more granularity in particular chart. chart, as long as data is there, you could specify time chart span equal one or shorter. Uh, one second is the shortest interval Splunk understands. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, the, the sad part is, is I wanted to show you the entire interval of data. And if I used a smaller interval, the, the it would be um, uh, not only more granular, but it will also give me... Um, uh, faster drawing of my charts. But again, uh, if I weren't running Zoom and all the other stuff, it would draw it quite uh, better, you know, faster anyway. But again, you have to play with the sample data and the sample charts. If you have Kix PA, it's relatively simple to just stream some data off to your Splunk server and view it there. Any other questions? No, perhaps you can give everyone your email address again, and if they think of something, they can send it to you. Did I not put it right on the front page? I might not have. Probably was if you just zoom back to that one. Yeah, when I send you this, uh, I'll send you a PDF to upload, and what I will do is I'll put it right on the front page here. Yeah, so okay. you'll have my email address. Yep. Brilliant. Or, or, or people, if you do have questions, you can email me. Um, I'll give you my email address in a minute, and then I can pass them on to Israel. Um, but yeah, I think no one else is coming up with an answer, so I will move on. Let me see if I can share my screen or not. I'll stop sharing. That would be the way to do it. I think I've done it. I think I've taken control. Hey, yes, there we are. So we've been watching. So um, moving on then, uh, Kix News don't seem to have any, but uh, Kix articles and blogs, there's quite a lot. We've got Using Open ID Connect with Kix Liberty by Eric Fan. That's in the Kix part of the IBM Z and Linux One community website. 
uh, in the same place. We've got On The Move, Data Migration from VSAM to DB2 by Nina Mursky fitton um, who I think is one of the co-presenters for our, our January session. Um, in Enterprise Tech Journal, we've got Kick Serviceability Enhancements to Dump and Trace. That's by Darren Beard and uh, Andy Wright. Then going back to the um, Kickspot, the IBM Z and Linux One community, we've got Kix Explorer, Zos Explorer, and Kix TS version 5.6. That's by Dave Nice. And we've got TLS 1.2 session ID caching for Kix in Assist Splex. And that's by Ian Mitchell. And that's all of them. So, yeah, feedback requests then is. Uh, uh, there to ask you for any feedback you've got about this meeting um, and uh, my email address then is on screen that's uh, trevor at .com. oh and just forgot to mention that those articles i just showed you uh, there's links to them on our website so coming soon um, our next meeting then is in January and it's driving Kix development operations and management success with Kix tools. And the presenters are Satish Tanner and Nina Mursky Fitton, and they're both offering managers for Kix tools, Z system software, and IBM. And our meeting after that is 9th of March when we've got uh, Eugene Hudders uh, or Gene Hudders presenting again. So that should be interesting to see. Just a reminder that you can keep up to date with what's happening in the world of kicks and on the virtual CICS user group website by following us on Facebook, Twitter, or joining the virtual kicks group on LinkedIn. And the URLs are all on the home page of our website. Um, and just a reminder, that's virtualcics.hostbridge.com. And if you use Facebook or anything else, the uh, hashtag to use is hashtag virtual kicks if you're going to be talking about us. Now, I know in the past that some members of the user group have completed the mainframe user survey conducted by the Arcati mainframe yearbook. So if you can spare 10 or perhaps 15 minutes of your time, I know they'd be very glad to hear from you. So the link for the user survey is on screen. Um, and if you're a vendor and you haven't done so already, you can get a free entry in the yearbook by following the vendor link. Okay, well, that's all for this meeting of the Virtual CICS user group. Can I thank you all for attending? Um, thanks to Hostbridge Technology, they're the people who sponsor this user group and make it possible. And of course, I'd particularly like to thank Ezreal Gross for his presentation. So that's it. Thank you all very much for joining the meeting. And Trevor? And, oh, yes. One other comment, right? Uh, if there's a particular topic within the world of kicks that you want to hear about, please forward those to Trevor. Sorry to throw you under the bus there, Trevor, but we're happy to present any of the topics that might be of interest to the Kix user community. So uh, we can actually dynamically build any presentation on any topic within Kix that you want, that you'd like to hear about. So if you send us some topics you'd really like to hear about, we would be happy to um, build or distribute presentations based on that information, right? I know it's difficult sometimes to get education in the world of kicks. And so if you're looking for a specific topic and you haven't seen a presentation on it uh, and you'd like to see one, please let us know. Ezreal, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, hey Ezreal, Mike Chiquinta, how are you? Hey, Mike, how are you? Good. Um, I have a question about uh, Splunk and the and the uh, the streaming side of this. And you you said it's not streaming, of course, but um, you have to you have to feed into it. Forwarding, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to feed into it the SMF data that you that you extract. Um, there are three exits in SMF that allow you to pipe that data directly somewhere. Is there any thought to pulling live or real near real time data into into I don't know how it would be done, but um, um, but anyway, somehow pick it up yes. near real time data and form that over to to Splunk. Yes, there. <laughs> so there has been many 
discussions just around that topic. Yep. The the issues always fall short in that would force you sort of almost to collect all the data all the time, right? Um, uh, even if you use Kix PA to narrow down the amount of fields that you physically collect, it would still be on all the time. And you'd almost have to build a product around how right. you manage what data would physically go there, right? Because and the, it and comes then that's real CDP. time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then IBM does have CDP. There are other things that will allow you to dynamically uh, st stream data rather than collect it in SMF and then report on it. Um, if you have some ideas that you'd like to see, I know that there are, they are exploring it as we speak. So it's funny, you know, that you mention it, but um, it, it's been uh, the topic of conversation quite frequently uh, recently, um, how, to, how to exactly uh, get more of a streaming type fashion. But right. again, well, the biggest the biggest problem is the amount of data you collect, right? Right. Well, I mean, the real power behind KixPA is its ability, ability to curate the data to summarize it. So yeah. it wouldn't be a real time or near real time streaming, but it could be every every five minutes or every ten minutes, take the data and then summarize it, and then or whatever you're going to do, filter it, and then you use the power of KixPA and then send it on. This point. Yeah. Well, if you send me how you'd like to see that work, I can get that right in front of the right people, right? right. And, um, well, there's Eric. Eric made a note. KixPA can read the logs. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I would say, Mike, just send me a note on what you'd like to see. That would be the best way to move forward, right? Because then it'll come up in discussions and you're – you've got quite a number of transactions running every day. So, um, you know, uh, there might be some questions back and forth, but I know they're, they're in process of looking at doing something. So now's a good time. All right, great. And we're in the process of doing some, some work with KixPA and Splunk. So uh, uh, it might be a little while till we, till we have those questions. So, uh, but uh, I, I will, yes. thank you. And hopefully you're willing to share some of the dashboards, right? You know, what <laughs> yep. you found useful, right? Because again, the key is, is, is this is just a sample, right? Because we, we didn't get enough user input from different customers to say, this is exactly what I want, or this is exactly what I want to see. So we just made it up, right? And it was mostly me. So, you know, at the end of the day, I just picked stuff that I, I've looked at in the past. But if there's things I've overlooked, you know, we're always trying to boost or enhance what, what we provided in that support pack. Thank you. Good, good job, of course, as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Um, yes. Yeah, so I was just saying thank you all very much for attending. And uh, our next meeting will be on the 12th of March. So I look forward to seeing you all then. So thank you. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>